All right, so we start with God. And here's our how soul. Oh, this time what I'm going to do, instead of drawing us as half of the soul as I normally would, so if you're a male, that would be the male half of the soul, and if you're a female, that would be the fem feminine half of the soul. Let's just draw us as a... My, this is not very good here, is it? I'll just see if I go with a different rubber. That doesn't work much either. I think we'll discard that pen and go to a different one in my collection. All right, so instead let's draw our true self as a circle. That's me, my true self. Now, my true self isn't the person that I want to look like to everyone else. It isn't the person that I want everybody else to perceive me to be. It's actually the person that God sees. That's our true self. They're then wrapped around our true self. There are just layers of things wrap, wrapping around our true self. You often refer to them as like onion layers that you're digging down through emotionally, right? So the first layer above our true self, and you could say our true self is full of what you would call causal emotions, right? Or emotions that are the emotions, the real emotions that prevent our relationship with God. They're there in that true self. But around our true self, there is a layer generally of fear. Does that make sense? So the fear is blocking us from accessing our true self. Kinds of fears might be, I'm afraid that you might see me as a terribly bad person. And so what I do is I put on, when I'm with you, then I put on a front. So that, so that you see a different person than what I perceive myself to be or of what I really am. Now that's my fear that I'm not allowing myself to feel. That fear is dictating that action. And I'm afraid of you seeing me as I truly am, so I now put on the front. And the fear is the thing that allows me to put on that front. And then what happens with the fears is our fears, uh, usually these fears are all created, of course, during our childhood and our environment creates them. And so what happens, our fears then dictate the next layer of what happens in our life. And the next layer of what happens in our life is... Our addictions. So if I'm afraid of you seeing me as I truly am, I then set up a system that I create and I create through this system an addiction. I'm addicted to you seeing me differently to what I truly am. I want you to see something different than what I see because I'm so terrified about what I see inside of myself and I don't want to feel that and so what I do instead of doing that is I want you to see something completely different to what I feel myself to be and so I set up these addictive interactions with people around me and so I want them to placate that fear that I have the fear of my true self or the fear of seeing myself as I truly am and those addictions go into play then when my addictions are not met I do another thing. So this is another circle. What is that? Anger. So I start getting angry with my environment somehow. And when I say with my environment, it is usually the people in my environment that I get the most angry with. But sometimes it's with the environment itself, isn't it? Like a mozzie comes along, bites you on the arm, you're angry with the environment. It, the mozzie never met your addiction. He shouldn't attack you. Bang. That's also a simple action that is taken out of anger of attack, something that ha didn't meet your addictions. Does that make sense? And it, it plays across, right across into, very, from very simple areas of our life, right the through to very complicated areas of our life, which we'll talk about as we go on. Now, in amongst all of this, God is wanting to have a relationship with us. But can you see the problem? You see, God has her Holy Spirit, which is like a conduit that 
this is us now, us, not, not just our true self, but now there's all this stuff now within us. And God is trying to connect to us via this connection called the Holy Spirit, which is the connection by, via which God, it's like a conduit via which God can pump us full of God's love if we have a longing for that love. And so we're there longing for this love, or thinking we are, but we've got all these fears, addictions and anger all in place around our true self. Now, God's wanting to connect to our true self. In fact, the only way God can connect is to our true self. Does that make sense? It's the only way God can connect. So this Holy Spirit, which is available everywhere in the universe to any person who has a longing for God, it cannot connect with us. And if there's no connection, you remember the Holy Spirit is also a spirit of truth. So in other words, unless we are in our true self, nothing can flow. Nothing can get in. And so what's happening is God's Holy Spirit's there waiting for a connection. It's waiting for us to deal with our fears, deal with our addiction, deal with our anger. Now, God's got a lot of other things in play to help us with those three things, and we'll talk about that as we go on. But for the moment, the main thing to understand is that God's love cannot flow into a soul unless the soul itself is in a position. And remember, in the course of a day, this position may waver, so you might have 10 minutes of the day where you're in your true self. Now in that 10 minutes, God can connect with you. Right? But if you're at the rest of the day you're in addictions, then God can't connect you there. And so you, can you see, this is why we only receive dribs and drabs of divine love. And this is also why many people who have been in Christian religions, who have received some divine love, get to a certain point where they can't receive any more. And the reason why they can't is because these fears, addictions and anger that is all laying, layering around the true self are not being dealt with. And unless they're dealt with, that spirit, Holy Spirit connection cannot be made and the divine love, which is the thing that flows through the Holy Spirit to the person, cannot flow. Can you see how important it is to your relationship with God, that fear, addictions and anger are dealt with. Can you see that? Without you dealing with those things, what happens is that the connection with God cannot be maintained. And usually what we find happening in the course of a practical day is we might have a little bit of time in the morning where we get a bit of time for ourselves and we pray a bit for, a, for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And in that time, we might be connected to our true self and so we receive some divine love. Does that make sense? And then what happens after that? After that, what happens is we get out of our true self into some fears. The day kicks in, you know. We have to have the coffee to start the day because now we're a bit, bit worried about the day. And the day, the day kicks in. And as the day kicks in and goes progressively further through the day, we've got all of these pressures, responsibilities, day-to-day -day life now affecting our longing for God. And a lot of the times, we don't realise, but a lot of the times we are in our addictions with almost every interaction that happens during the day. Now in that space, our true self is now under buried, under these addictions and fears and as a result of that our true self isn't being expressed and we cannot receive God's love during that time and then sometimes by the end of the day we're quite tired sometimes quite emotional by the end of the day we sit down to have a rest and now we're starting to get back in touch with ourselves this is what normally happens for us we start getting in touch with ourselves to a degree and as that happens, we start to reconnect with our true self, the real person we are. And we feel, oh, that was an overwhelming day. And you feel a bit emotional about that, perhaps, or a bit sad about it. Maybe even might cry about it. Or there might be other things occurring as well. And as a result of that, you are now getting back in touch with your true self and some more divine love can flow in that day. Now, if you look at your 24 hours, so we've got 24 hours... How many minutes is that? Yeah. Anyone's good at maths? It's times by 60, isn't it? So what's that? 
What is it? Well, do we have to do long multiplication on the... Do we have to do a mass <laughs> class now forever, do we? Right. It's 24 by 6. What's 24 by 6? It's 1, 4, 4, eight. That's how many minutes there are in a day. All right. Mm. And how many of those minutes did I say we were connecting with God? 10, maybe 20. So how's that as a ratio? 20 out of 1440. That's, that's not very much, is it, really, when you look at it in terms of the slice. Now, you know what we often do with that? We often go, 10 years later, we go, God, I've been searching for you for 10 years. <laughs> no, you've been searching for God 20 minutes of the day for 10 years. Basically, that's what's been happening. So we need to address that. So this is what's going on with us most of, our, most of our lives. So we want to stop this process. We want to get to a place where we're in our true self most of the time. Can you see that? And to do that, we're going to have to understand some things about ourselves. We're going to have to understand our fears. We need to understand our addictions. And we need to understand the reasons for our anger. Can you see? And if we can start getting into those things, then some divine love will flow. Now, there's a lot of people who talk about God's love and they say, no, no, that none of what AJ is saying there is true. What it is, is God's love automatically deals with all of those things. And I want to tell you that that's not true. It's not true that God's love automatically deals with those things. In fact, a uh, hundred years or so ago, when we channeled to James Paget, I actually wrote a message to James Paget about this. And I'd just like to read it to you. All right? This is what it says. I am here, Jesus. I desire to write tonight on the subject of how the redeemed soul is saved from the penalties which sin and error has brought upon it. When the soul is in a condition of sin and error, in other words, when the soul has all of these things going on inside of its causal true self and all of these different things that motivate its actions out of harmony with love, and remember all sin is, is disharmony with love. That's all sin is. So when we talk about sin, we're talking about the disharmony with love in our soul. When the soul is in a condition of disharmony with love, it is not responsive to the inflowing of the Holy Spirit. And in order to get into condition of receptivity to these influence, it must have an awakening as to its actual condition of enslavement by these things. In other words, while we have all of these things in play, we are not open to the reception of divine love through the Holy Spirit. We're not open to the connection. If we're not open to the connection, we've got to have some other kind of awakening to get us open to the connection. Does that make sense? The divine love itself doesn't open our connection. We have to be open first before the divine love can flow into our soul. I said, until such an awakening comes to it, there is no possibility of it receiving the love of God into it. And in turning its thoughts to the truths of God and to the practices of life that will help it in its progress towards the condition of freedom. So while this state, while I am blind, while I'm blind here and also here, to what fears I have, what addictions I have and the anger that I have buried inside me, while I'm blind to all of that, I am in a condition of unreceptivity. I am in a condition of resistance to God. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah? And by the way, feel free to ask any questions as we go. So does everyone that make sense? So while I'm in that state all blocked up, the divine love cannot flow into my soul. It's only those moments in time when I'm unblocking and seeing something, that's the moment in time. Peter, you, if we can have a mic there. You don't need to turn it on. It's already on. Oh, did you? That's not how you turn it on. It's best to just leave them on. That's it. AJ, how, how does that relate to prayer then as being the main, the main one of the, the most important ways to, to connect to God? And, and also, how does, how does what you're uh, explaining relate to um, the orthodox Christian view 
of creating a connection to God. All right. Well, firstly, let's address prayer. What is prayer? Prayer is the sincere and pure longings of the soul, the true self, towards God. Now, can you say that you have sincere longings when you've got a heap of fear, a heap of addictions in play and a lot of anger inside? Now, obviously, there's less effectiveness there, isn't there? If we, if we start addressing the fears, addictions and anger, we can have some pure longings. And remember, prayer is the pure longing of the soul. It's not the soul going, oh, I think I'll have a prayer with God. I'll just sit down for 10 minutes and I'll ask for God to give me this or give me that or do this for me or do that for me. Without me facing myself, God requires that you face yourself in the process. And that's what prayer is in the end. Prayer is the longings of your soul in its pure state. And that only happens, for most of us, a few minutes of the day. And to be honest, how many of you feel divine love flowing every minute of the day? Like It's very rare, isn't it? And in fact, to get to that point, you have to be actually at one with God. That's the time when you're at one with God, you will actually have divine love flowing every minute of the day. And what I'm trying to explain to you today is what's blocking that love from flowing every minute of the day. And it's these things the fear, addictions and anger. It's the lack of the awakening that I mentioned in the Paget messages. When I said, until such awakening comes to it, there is no possibility of receiving divine love. So you can pray all you like in terms of the physical act of talking to God, but the prayer is not going to reach any further than your brain and the waves that come out of it because it can't unless it's pure. God connects with the pure soul, the one, and often there's a words that we use, the repentant soul and all of those other kinds of terms we might use, and that's the connection that God maintains. Now the second question, Pete, I can't remember, so you have to, if you can remember it for me. The second question was, well, how does that relate to uh, Orthodox Christianity <laughs> right. and, and people going along to church and, and, and believing that they're in the zone, and they're praying and connecting, and yep. I'm, I mean, are, are they? <laughs> well, obviously, there are times like you go to if you go along to how many of you have been along recently to some Pentecostal church or something like that? How many? Just a few. Okay, it's interesting when you go along because there are times when you can see God's love is flowing into the individual's present, and that's the times usually when their emotions are free and open. And they have a deep longing. Most of the time it's happening when they're singing or some kind of uh, thing like that is going on. And they're feeling really emotional towards God, feeling a lot of desire and love for God. And in that moment, divine love flows into their soul. So in that moment, divine love flows. But in most other moments of their life, they're not in that state. And therefore, divine love cannot flow. In, in, in any other state than that state. And what I'm saying to you today is these are the reasons why divine love doesn't flow all the time to most people. is because they're unwilling to have the awakening as to the perception of their true self, of their true nature, what's really going on inside of them. They're unwilling to actually awaken to what the error is present inside of them. If I can continue reading this, because it's, I said... I would not have mankind believe that any soul is compelled to stay in this condition of slavery to sin until the Holy Spirit comes to it with the Father's love to bestow it in all abundance. For the mission of the Holy Spirit is not to awaken man's soul to a realisation of sin and death. So the mission of the Holy Spirit isn't to awaken man's soul but merely to bring the divine love to the soul when the soul is ready to receive it. That's the mission of the Holy Spirit. The soul has to be gotten by us us, through our free will into a state where we can receive divine love. When we're in a state where we can receive it, the Holy Spirit makes a connection to our soul. Once it makes a connection to our soul, what happens? Now the, Holy, the, Holy, the connection is made, the conduit is established, the divine love flows into our soul. That's what happens. The awakening, in other words, the awakening to these things, the sin and error that exists within the soul, the awakening must come from other causes that influence the mind as well as the soul. 
and cause them to realise that the life man lives is not the correct life or the one in accord with the demands of the law of God or with the real longings of their own hearts and souls. Let me illustrate. Today or last week, how many of you actually did what you really wanted to do? Really wanted to do? The whole week? A few? Yeah? Now, can you see straight away that most of us are ready to do things we don't want to do? Why is that? The reason why is because we have addictions. We, we believe, we have belief systems in play, false beliefs, they're all false beliefs by the way, we have false belief systems in play that tell us, I've got to work 40 hours, otherwise, what's the fear? I won't have enough money to pay my mortgage. And I'm driving along to work and I'm going, whoa, each kilometre I drive, my heart sinks a bit, right? For many of us, that's the way it is when we drive to work because we don't really want to go to that job. Right? So what are we doing to go to that job? We are further and further detuning from our true self. Does that make sense? And by the time we got to the work, we are now totally out of harmony with our true self. Because what does our true self want to do? It's screaming at us saying, I don't want to be here anymore. I don't want to be here anymore. I want to go and do something else. That's what it's saying, right? But we are too afraid or we're too much in our addictions to go and embrace a life that we're passionate about and as a result of all that we enjoy. And so as a result, we stay doing the fear-based thing out of an addiction. Does that make sense? And as we stay doing the fear-based thing out of the addiction, can God connect to us in that place? No, not anymore. Karen, you'd like to, if you have a mic, just down. I used to really want to do a lot of things, and now I find that I don't have the desire, and I don't know why that happens. Yeah, and um, a lot of times what happens when we first start hearing the divine truth, we go through this really strange stage, right? And the strange stage is we, we almost feel, the, the, our fears kick in actually, because we're so afraid of disappointing God in some way that we don't do anything at all. We're like a person who's so, so afraid to actually go out and do what we desire. We're so worried that our desires might be out of harmony with truth or out of harmony with love that we, we actually decide, oh, I'm not going to do that and I won't do that because that's got this even. Instead of just doing it still and actually bringing our desires into harmony with the love, we have a tendency then to avoid the process of acting. And that is what suppresses those desires that we used to have. Also, at the same time, what is going on is we start recognizing, oh, I used to really like doing that. You know, like I used to really like eating lots of ice cream. You know, you know the story that I've already told you. Like I get a four litre tub of ice cream, cut it into fours with a knife, bring out one litre <laughs> on the plate, pour it over with the topping. That was my dinner. Right? I didn't believe in having, like, I, I believed in having ice cream before dinner. Like, well, if you think about it, it makes sense. You know, you've got the most room for the thing you like the most. But anyway, so, so, so what I was doing there is just I, I, I was in this place where I was just enjoying eating my ice cream. And then, uh, you know, as you progress, you go, oh, you know, oh, wait, I wonder how they produce this ice cream. All oh, right, you know, like, and you go through all of that, and you have a look in the internet, and you investigate all of those things, and you come out. Wow, they, you know, they kill all these calves, and they all go off to the slaughter, and this all happens, and that all happens, and then they feed these cows this thing, and a lot of them are kept in these little booths. And by this time, by this, my conscience is now starting to bother me about this ice cream, right? So now I'm not feeling good about eating my ice cream that I used to enjoy, right? So, uh, but I still want to have it because it tastes nice still and everything else is still going on. So, so I'm going through this phase where I, I'm thinking things like, what do I do? What do I do with that particular thing or that particular thing? You know? and, and so a lot of times I start getting myself really mixed up with my desires and passions. The key is to not do that. The key is to go ahead with your desires and passions but keep them in harmony with love or bring them into harmony with love. And in fact, if you allow God to help you with this process, which we'll talk about in a minute how that happens, 
your fears and addictions will all be get, dealt with and your life will automatically come in harmony with love, but you'll be passionate doing things. So you'll actually find, if you're finding right now that you're quite sort of down, depressed and not really getting much accomplished, that's because you're afraid to act and that's a fear. That's not uh, a thing to do with your true self. Does that make sense to everyone? So my suggestion, Karen, is there's two things happening. One, that I'm first in the state where I'm afraid to act because I'm afraid that one of the things I act in might actually be in disharmony with one of God's laws and I'm afraid of somehow getting punished. And I need to deal with that fear because God's not a punishing God. I just need to feel the results of every action that I take. Secondly, sometimes at the beginning my conscience bothers me. And so then I stop doing the things that I used to desire, but I don't replace those desires or merge those desires into love. And we need to do both of those things. I'll just keep reading this. It says, Until this awakening comes to the soul, comes, the soul is really dead, so far as to having a consciousness of the existence of the truths or of its redemption is concerned. And such death means... Continuance of the thoughts of evil and sin, which are all related to our fears and our addictions and our anger and rage, in the life which leads only to, to condemnation and death for long, long years, it might be. So, so what often happens is because we have these things in play and we're wanting to maintain a sense of blindness to them, what we finish up doing is we... Allow years to go past. And years and years go past. And we, we really make very little progress in love. One of the questions I was going to ask you earlier was, how many of you feel you've progressed in the demonstration of your love in the last six months? So how many of you feel that? So quite a number. That's it's really lovely. Some of you haven't actually progressed. In fact, some of you have regressed in the demonstration of your love in the last six months, then you, you can feel that too. You feel that in your soul. And the reason why, the only reason why we can make progress is because we start addressing the awakening of our soul. The awakening of our soul, seeing ourselves as we truly are. And in fact, in the end, remember, we've talked in the past about other things, but one of the things is seeing ourselves as God sees us, warts and all. right? That's what we need to see. And of course, God looks down and sees us, warts and all, and still loves us and knows our pure, the pure part of our soul that's in there. So God still feels that for us. But God also sees the fear that you have and God sees the addictions that you have and God sees how you were unloving here and how you were unloving there and what you did last week that was unloving to your partner or your neighbour or your child. God sees all those things too. And what we need to do is come to see the same things. Because if we saw them, we probably wouldn't do them anymore. That's why we need to see them. And unless we see them, we will not have the awakening we need to have. But come nearer to the point of my discourse, I said, this was 100 years ago, the soul that is existing in sin and error will have, sooner or later, to pay the penalties for such sin and error. And there is no escape from the payment of these penalties except in the redemption that the Father provided by the new birth. So in other words, I can stay in these sin and error, in the addictions, the anger, the rage, the fear, and not deal with any of those for as long as I desire. God has given me the free will to make that choice. So God has allowed me to choose to remain in that place for as long as I want. However... There is penalties associated with staying in those places because every one of these things creates actions and creates words and deeds that, that actually damage your environment and damage yourself. So at the end of the day, we just get darker if we do that. Right? We don't want to do that if we really want to get closer to God. These penalties are only the natural results of the operation of God's laws and they must be endured until the full penalty is paid. Even though a man may progress to a higher condition of soul excellence and have such happiness, yet he must pay the last farthing and thus release himself from these penalties. So in other words, these penalties, these things here, which are not just our, the results of our own 
sin or missing the mark with regard to love, but they are also the result of the sins or the missing of the mark of love of our environment. Right? So we grew up in an environment that is already unloving for most of us. You look at our day-to-day -day actions as a collective human race. Right, right now, in Japan, there's got, they've got the issues with the nuclear reactors, right? Well, who ever thought of building a nuclear reactor in the first place? It, it, does that seem to be a loving thing, that something could go wrong and actually cause the destruction of thousands, tens of thousands, or hundreds of thousands of people? Can you see it was born from an unloving decision in the first place? And in the end, from a fear, the creation of those things. And we're now dealing with the consequences of that fear being expressed and turned into actions. Right? And in particular, the Japanese people have had a history of the consequences of that in their lives, have they not? And yet, as a, na as, as a world, we do not learn. Why? Because we want to remain blind to ourselves. We don't want to have the awakening we need to have to make the changes that need to occur. Does that make sense? Now, in the prayer for divine love that's mentioned in the Paget messages, I'd just like to read you one line of it, because this is a part of the topic today. It says, this is part of the prayer to God. Keep us in the shadow of your love every hour and moment of our lives and help us to overcome all temptations of the flesh and the influence of the powers of the evil ones who so constantly surround us. You remember those words when you read them? Many of you have read those words. Right, so there's two issues there. There's the temptations of the flesh, and then there's the influence of people around us who influence us into following the temptations of the flesh. Does that make sense? And I know that sounds all very uh, Christian and, and whatever, but if you think about your practical day-to-day -day life, there is many times where you're tempted away from love, is there not? Where you're tempted to be angry or get into a rage with somebody or all of that. Now, automatically in that place, we are surrounded by spirits as well, right in the same condition, who want to help you do that action. They are ones who want to make, make it worse, make your life worse. They want to enjoy seeing your degradation. And so they help you go and do that. How can they do that? They can only do that because we have fears and addictions and anger in play. Because if we were willing to feel those feelings without acting upon them, they would never be able to influence us. No one in your life, no one in this world, can ever influence you as long as you are willing to stay feeling your feelings and have every feeling in harmony with love. Not a single person can influence you out of love when you stay in that place. So if we are receiving influence from our external environment, whether it be spirits or people on earth, it's because we have our fears and addictions in play. We don't want to face those fears and addictions. So can everyone see how important it is to have this discussion? Yeah? So it's really important to start facing some of this stuff. Is there any questions so far? Chris, up the back there. Just keep your hand up, Chris, because people don't know who you're here. That's it. Hi. Um, I'm wondering if any other substance besides divine love flows from God? Uh, yes, there are lots of other substances that flow from God, but the divine love is the only substance that flows through the, through the Holy Spirit that is, permanent, that, that is designed as a connection to the human soul. Does that make sense? But there are lots of other substances. In fact, in fact, all of our life, our actual life force, is a force that flows through the universe from God as well. Totally different substance, and yet it flows constantly from God. Now, most of us are open to accepting that, and so we stay alive and, and life continues. And in fact, the entire universe is pregnant with life as a result of that particular substance. But that's not the substance that's going to transform your soul. The substance that will transform your soul is divine love and that flows through the, the only connection it can flow through, which is the Holy Spirit. Does that okay. make sense? I've got one more question. Yeah. Um, you know how you said spirits connect to us in our anger? Yep. If we're in our true self, do spirits help us as long as they're as well? Um, 
There are certainly spirits that help us with our true self, but they are always going to be spirits who love us. In other, in other words, they're going to be loving spirits. Any spirit who loves you will want you to connect with your real self, no matter what's in there. And if what's in there is a bit of rage and anger, or a childhood rage I'm talking about, or childhood grief or whatever, then those spirits who love us will want to help us connect to that emotions. But spirits who don't care about us very much, they are more interested in connecting there to us. So these are the malevolent spirits. Well, let's, in the Paget messages, we called them the evil ones. They're not permanently evil in that they could change just like any other person can change, but they desire to influence us in our addictions so that they can get their addictions met. So you imagine if I'm a drinker, in the, I'm a drinker on earth, alcoholic on earth, I pass over into the spirit world. What's my physical addiction? Alcohol abuse, is it not? I, and there's no alcohol in the spirit world. Sorry to say that for you guys who want there to be, but that's the way it is. So, so what do I do? I'm looking for this addiction. I want this addiction. Right? It's a physical addiction, not an emotional one at this, that we're recognising at this point. We're just focused on a physical one. What, do I, what am I going to do? The only thing that's open to me to do, unless I deal with my emotional reason why I have the addiction is to go and find a person on earth that I can connect with and share in the experience of drinking alcohol with. And this is why you have people on earth, they're sitting at the bar, they don't even know who they are, still standing upright, drinking. They're, they've drank enough to, to, to like, kill a horse, but they're still, <laughs> they're still drinking. Why? Because not, it's not just them sharing in the act. It's now all these spirits. But what's the person motivating the person on earth? Well, they're in an addiction too, an addiction of avoiding their emotions and a way to avoid their emotions. It might be their fear, their unworthiness or some other really painful emotions from their life experience. Now, while they're avoiding that emotion, what do they do? They turn to drink and that helps them avoid the emotion. But unfortunately, some of the spirits who also want to avoid their emotions share in that process and make the process even worse. Does that make sense? That's what happens. The spirits who love us don't do that. The spirits who love us care about our worth, care about our, our progress. They want us to connect to God and so therefore they don't desire us to stay in our addictions. Yeah. Is that all, Chris? Yeah. Done? Thanks, AJ. No worries. Anyone else have a question? If we come down here and then across to Robert over there. Let's just here first. AJ, whenever I try and get real about my true self and about how I actually am, yep. I get into a real self-judging place and I don't know how to see myself as I am without going to that judging place. So you go into a self-punishment. Yeah. Yep. Self-punishment is also an addiction. And we need to come to recognise that it is. So, so what would you do if you were in an addiction? Let's say you had a problem with smoking and, um, and you were giving it up. What would you do? Would you, would you have the smokes laying by the bedside table? You wouldn't, would you? What would you do with them? Get rid of them. Yeah, most, most people jump up and down on them, throw them in the bin, and, and then later on at night <laughs> search through the bin for that. <laughs> for that. <laughs> Can you see, what we often do is we revert back to the behaviour that is a part of the addiction. Self-punishment is an addictive behaviour established usually by our parents, actually. So whenever we learnt, when we were young children, that one way to get mum and dad's approval is to agree with their punishment of us. Right? So therefore we go into this self-punishment phase every time we notice something that we feel is bad about ourselves. Now, self-punishment is also an addiction. So we need to address that as an addiction rather than actually acting out the self-punishment and punishing ourselves even further. Does that make sense? So, so we'll talk about how to do that later in the discussion. If, as long as you understand at this point that self-punishment, a self-attack, is, is an addiction in itself. And we need to address that addiction if we really want to progress. Now, the problem is, when I'm prepared to punish myself, evil spirits who are around me are also then prepared to punish me. So they come in and even worsen the emotion. 
And that's what happens yeah. because instantly I, I just hear them. You're bad, you're bad, you're bad, you're bad. Yeah, they'll, stay, they'll start saying things to you, saying you're a bad person anyway. Because what, what do they want you to do? They want you to give up the quest for truth and love and go back to satisfying their addictions, whatever those addictions were. That's what they want to do. Does that make sense? So, so they want you to punish yourself because in the place of self-punishment, you know what you often do? You just give up. You just go, oh, blow this. You know, usually we use the F word or two. Blow this. I'm tired of feeling this bad. And no wonder because you're punishing yourself all the time. And so we go, I'm tired of feeling this bad. I'm just going to give up anyway and I'll just go back to my old life. How many of you have thought like doing that in the last six months? Exactly. See? It's, a, it's, a, it's something that happens on a regular basis and it's something we need to deal with as an addiction. We have that addiction because we're invested in our parents' viewpoint of ourselves. So, so when our parents punished us, they needed a justification for that punishment. And so, what, and so what we start doing is we start justifying to ourselves our own punishment of ourselves. Now, God doesn't want you to punish yourself. God wants you to change. You're not going to change punishing yourself more. Does that make sense? We're only going to change if we realise that that's one of our addictions and where, what it's related to. We'll talk more about what it's related to perhaps at another time. Yeah. Now, I was over here, uh, there was... Oh, AJ, my yep. question was so similar, it's probably been, okay. an been answered, I'd say. Okay, yeah. so that's dealt with. If we go to Dave, just straight behind, and then across. AJ, in regards to, to faith, I heard you on a download recently say that faith comes to us in a similar way to the Holy Spirit. So when we pray for faith, and I've had my guides often mention to pray for faith, so we're asking for God to, to give us faith or is it something that we can bring from within us? And I presume it's, it's going to help us to, um, to feel how we are or to see us how we really are. The irony, Dave, is that faith, true faith, really only comes from divine love entering the soul. When you feel that love entering your soul for the first time, you'll realise, number one, that God exists, number two, that God can give you love, and number three, that you can receive it. Now, in that place, you now have a greater faith. And then as God gives you more and more love, your faith will grow. So the truth is that a prayer for faith is just often a prayer for more love so that we can have more, a greater personal experience. Now, in that talk about faith, I said, that, I said that faith is a real thing. It's a substantial thing. It's not something that we invent in our mind and then go ahead with. Faith is something that's happened to us. So, so as the divine love enters you, it happens to you. The event happens inside of yourself. And since that event happens, you now can have faith in it happening again. <laughs> Does that make sense? But before that event happens, it's very hard to have faith that it's going to happen. It's only when it happens that the faith generally is present. Does that make sense? So, so a prayer for faith is actually a longing for God to to demonstrate to you that you have reasons to have faith in God. And when you think about it, there is a lot of external help that we can receive to help us have faith in God. Help from our spirit friends, help from our experiences in our day-to-day -day life, and also examples of, that we see of other people who are in a place where they've received divine love. So we have many examples that we can emulate, and that gives us faith. But the true faith... The one that is the conviction inside only really occurs once we've received the divine love the first time and then after that the faith begins to grow. Does that make sense? So we can sort of use our intellect to develop a, a nearly a pseudo-faith until we get the real faith. We can, but um, it's not real, is it? Remember, everything you do in your intellect really in the end, you need to use your intellect to work things out. Just like I said in that message that I just read, you do need to use your mind to analyse things. But at the end of the day, until you have the experience, real faith will not be present. Does that make sense? And, and many Christian people who in, in Christian religions have had the experience. They have had the experience of having divine love enter them, and so they have faith. But then what they start to do is they start to believe the reason why they had the experience was because they believed in the blood of Jesus and they believed in all these different belief systems, some of which are very different to each other, even though the two people have had the same experience. So you might have two people in different religions with different beliefs having the same experience and they think it's because of their different beliefs. 
but it's not. It's because they had a longing for divine love in that moment and they had the experience. The experience transformed their soul. Now they had some faith, but then they start putting their faith in the wrong direction. Instead of putting their faith in, oh, I longed for God's love. That was the feeling I had. I had a feeling of remorse about my life. That was the feeling I had. And then God's love entered me. Oh, I can replicate that process. It's got nothing to do with the belief systems that I've got. It's got everything to do with the feelings that I had with God. And that's what we need to come to appreciate. Yeah. Just one more little thing then. So in our prayer for faith, mm -hmm. is, is that different then to our prayer for, for God's love, for the divine love? Well, yeah, you could say in a way that... Um, until you receive divine love, true faith will not actually occur inside of your soul because you're not yet having the experience. However, you do need to have some kind of belief that it's going to happen. Otherwise, you wouldn't even bother praying for love in the first place. Does that make sense? So we can actually pray that we actually get inside of us some kind of proof system, some kind of proof that comes from ex external systems into us that, that if we pray, we'll get an answer. <laughs> We need to have some of that intellectual thought as well in the process. Does that make sense? So it's not just all, all the heart, not none of the mind, but rather we need to use our mind in harmony with investigating truth and then you'll find you'll have the experience. Once you have the experience, you have the proof and then you can then work on replicating the experience by using that proof and evidence you have. Yep. Yep. If we go across... If we go across... If you keep your hand up there... That's it. Oh, hello, AJ. This is Carlos. I just would like to ask a question. Uh, when it comes to addictions, uh, most people refer addictions to something that is negative, and you mentioned smoking or drinking or whatever it is. What happens when the addiction actually happens to be a positive one, such as I care more about other people than myself? Or I do more to help others than I will do to help myself? It's a or, very good question. And, uh, and can I give you a very blunt answer? Please do. There is no such thing as That's a positive addiction. <laughs> you just answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> there is no such thing as a positive addiction. You see, every one of our... E see, this is one reason why we justify the holding on to some of our addictions. Because we believe they're positive. We believe they're good. We believe they are going to be good for other people. So what I do, I'm, I want to help other people. I help other people. I help other people. I'm saying, this is a wonderful addiction that I have because I'm helping so many people. But you know what we're doing in the end? We get exhausted. There's the proof. You see, love doesn't exhaust itself. Love is... It, it, like, you look at God. It, is, is God giving out love, giving out love? And all of a sudden, God goes, oh, I'm tired now. You know, <laughs> you know I'll have a rest from giving out love. Is that how it works, right? No. But that's how we are when we're in the addiction of so-called giving love. You see, you see, when we're not in the addiction of giving love, so-called, and we're really in a place of love, you will not be exhausted, ever, from giving. Ever. Right? And the exhaustion is proof that the love isn't, in play, isn't there. Because once we're at one with God, we will not have the exhaustion in play. So every addiction is unloving. Every single one of them. There's no such thing as a positive addiction. We'll talk more about this in a, in a while. That's going to be challenging for some of you. Well, thank you. That was sense? really good. Great yep. answer. If we come down to Katrina and then... AJ, not long ago you said that um, spirits want me to satisfy their addictions. It's something that I have really struggled with, really grasping. Are you willing to talk more about that? Um, yes, can I? I'm going to do a whole section on the spirit interplay with addictions because it's very important to understand the spirit interplay. You see, you may have no other person surrounding you on earth and yet you might still be heavily in addictions because you're in addiction with the spirits who are surrounding you. And so it's very important to understand the interplay that happens between yourself and your own addictions and how that draws these spirits into play. And then what they do with that. Because what they do is they revert to bribery in order to satisfy your addictions, threats in order to trigger your fear, or total blackmail in order to remove love from you, so-called love from you completely, so you get back into line. All right? 
Now, many of you have already had this happen with your family, your friends and, and other people around you with regard to trying to get closer to God. And, and these, are in, these are addictions in play from their point and also from ours that cause an interplay emotionally and we need to address them. We need to find out more about them. So I'll be dealing with those subjects more specifically as we go on today. Is that right? Jen? So if I'm meeting this information for the first time, yep. um, my question is about faith. Yep. I should then apply my faith so that when I'm getting angry, I'm, I'm feeling angry about something, my faith can kick in and I might not know what the addiction is. Mm -hmm. um, you can have, like you say, you can have faith that you must have the addiction, otherwise the anger wouldn't be present. And so there, where, where do I go from there? Okay, um, well, what I would do is I'd talk to God and I'd go, like, I'm angry, so now I'm being more truthful with God, am I not? I'm admitting that I'm angry. I've obviously got an addiction in play. I've obviously got a demand or an expectation that's not being met, otherwise I wouldn't be angry. But I've got no idea what it is. Can you help me find what it is? And then there's a whole series of other events that happen where God can help you with some positive spirits, with different events on earth, the law of attraction and so forth over the coming week will tell you what it is if you're open to hearing about it. The problem with our addictions though is that, is that we're a bit closed about hearing about them. Right? You think about it. The person who's smoking is going, oh, yeah, I need to give this up feels pretty good though, doesn't it? I know it's killing me, but do they really see their addiction yet? Not really yet, do they? Because at the moment they see their addiction in their feelings, now they will stop going and they'll realize, uh, actually, by me continuing to smoke while I'm thinking these things, I'm already <laughs> demonstrating I don't want to see my full extent of my own addiction. Right? And this is what we often do in our day-to-day -day life with our emotional addictions. We notice them, we get told them, most of the time we get told them through our law of attraction or through our prayer and what God answers through our prayer. However, we want to continue them because they are so entrenched within us that, and we're so afraid of what they cover over that our, we want to revert to them. Does that make sense? So there's a certain amount of self-deception there at that second layer. Yes. You might be getting angry and you might have this realisation that you do have an addiction, but there's a certain amount associated with the addiction that's self-deception, isn't yes. it? That keeps yep. you in that same place. Yeah, we can even admit that we have the addiction, but often we will stay in it until we have a desire to release the addiction. In the end, Jen, the real thing gets down to how much do you want a relationship with God? Because if you want a relationship with God really badly, you will deal with every addiction and every fear. But if you don't want a relationship with God badly enough, you won't. It's just that simple. When an addiction gets triggered or a fear gets triggered, you'll just go back to your old patterns if you don't want your relationship with God badly enough. And this applies, by the way, you might badly want a soulmate, you know, badly want a partner in your life and all those kind of things, but honestly, unless you want God, you are not going to deal with your addictions with your partner either. Because sooner or later, your partner will satisfy some of your addictions and you'll stagnate until you want to grow beyond that point. Then that brings in other aspects of things like desire versus how much pain that you're in. And so how much of your, how much from your heart do you actually desire to change your life and connect to a God that you may not, because of your addiction, you may not actually know is there. Or even believe or, is good. Yes. Or even believe cares about you or any of those things, you see. And, and this, is, this is the terrible damage of error on the planet. The terrible damage of error is that we have all these concepts of God that are very distorted and untrue. And because of that, we're starting out in this really, like, this, you could say the soul, the true self, is so constricted and trapped by all these false beliefs and all these false notions and all these false fe these feelings you know, that, that we have about God and the universe and how everything works that, that we can't even trust God enough to say, 
No, surely God must be good. And surely I can start with that one truth. You know, a lot of us can't even start there. And that's why a lot of times I've been encouraging people to try to deal with their emotions to a degree first. Because at the end of the day, unless you deal with some of them, you won't even see what's there even to, to even think that there's a God out there that, you, that wants to connect with you. And, and I feel often quite sad when I look at the world because I, I see how strongly man's false belief systems and all of their pressures to maintain these false beliefs cause the individual self, the, per, the person who is struggling to have a joyful life, to actually connect to the one true source who can give them that joyful life. And, and it's such a sad thing to see that we've got to go through all this fear and addictions and emotions and grief and then a- and anger just to even realise that there's a God there that what loves us and wants to connect to us. So it seems to me my question's answered because I was going to ask a question about faith. How does faith... Well, fa- yeah, you, you can see how that- faith is important. I've got to at least at some point at least in my head even, even if it's not yet in my heart, think there must be a God there that I can actually receive some love from. Otherwise, I'm never going to start the process. And that's the sad thing that's happened to our world, is that there's so much belief about there not being a God, you know, God's forgotten us, God's dead, God's all of these other things, or God's a punishing God is like my dad, you know, God's like my dad, or God's like my mum, and well, my dad and mum, you know, often we feel they're not weren't they good, so we often impose a lot of these false beliefs upon God, and in the process that causes us to not have much faith. Why would I long for love from a God like that, or why would I long for love from a being that doesn't even exist? So I don't even start. And that's the sad thing I find. If you start, you will start to have some experiences that will tell you. Just, and this is what we say in the spirit world quite often to spirits. Just try the experiment. Be like a scientist who for the first time doesn't have a concept of something, doesn't know about it, doesn't understand it, and, but the scientist it goes at least has a thought, oh, maybe this might be true, I will give it a go. I will put together a group of experiments that I can test to see whether this is true or not. We at least need to do that at the beginning. And then we'll go back. Yeshua, I have had a lot of pain most of my life. Physical pain? Uh, That and emotional pain. Soul soul pain. And it's been so difficult and I've just had one thing, trauma after a trauma after trauma Mm -hmm. right throughout my life. And at some stage I really wanted to get to the truth. So I I wanted to find out what was going on, what was causing this pain. And what I ended up on a journey was uh, going into with this questioning and search for truth and search for just some form of relief from this pain. And so I entered into and settled into an area where I thought was going to give me a huge amount of answers, which was the new age, um, going into every healing modality that you could possibly imagine. Mm -hmm. You know, and I actually see now that how much I gave my power away to believing that a crystal was going to give me, take that pain away from me, it was going to give me the resolution and and, uh, that I really desired. Mm -hmm. And um, I put a lot of faith into those modalities and into those things because they were telling me that that was going to fix me. So you put a lot of faith in false beliefs, what you now see as false beliefs. Yes, yes, they were really just working with the effects of it and giving me a short-term effect um, or solution. But then the problem kept it going. But eventually, at the end of it, you know, I would think, oh, I'm free of that, oh, I'm free of that, oh, that's great, you know, I got through that. And then all of a sudden, down the track, I would find myself back to square one every same, time. Same thing again. And yep. now I see myself tr- buried. That true self is just buried under all of these things that I just really haven't dealt with, which I thought I was dealing with all of those years. And yep. so I now have addiction to truth to get to um, that true self and, and to that relationship with God. You I'm also have an, another addiction, though. Yes, and that sure. is... An addiction to not feeling your feelings of disillusionment. Mm. 
Do you know what I mean? Like, you see, a lot of times we've had a years of uh, searching, searching for this, searching for that. And after a while, we start getting quite like hurt about all these searches that we're involved in, right? We start feeling quite disillusioned about every search. Every search sort of starts ending dead end. We have, we have the cycle of the search. The cycle of the search generally is, Oh, it's going really, really good. Yeah, I really feel this is enthusiastic. This is going to work. We, oh, no, now this is going to work for me. Now it's permanent. Oh, I think I'm fixed now. And then all of a sudden, oh, I realise I'm not fixed. Uh, yeah, no, I've still got some more work to do. Oh, no, no, it's actually worse than that. I'm still actually right back at the beginning I was. And then I go through this terrible phase of, you could call it almost depression, right? Yeah. Where I go, oh, I just want to give up now. Uh, I don't see any point. You know, and we get real down about ourselves and depressed and low. And then, of course, we lift ourselves out of that slowly. We search for another one. <laughs> and then we go through the same cycle. Yeah. Yep. And the main reason why that happens is actually because of our addictions and fears. Yeah. And one of our addictions we have is that we don't want to feel the feeling of being disillusioned with error. We don't want to actually just go into that grief place of feeling we've searched all of our life and... And just wanting, you know, not, not to be depressed about it, which is the suppression of the emotion, but just to feel the feeling of just being to totally disillusioned with the entire process and how much that interferes with our, you know, our trust that God exists even and, and, and that God really wants to connect with us. And that's an emotion you need to let yourself, and you're connecting to it a little bit now, but that's the emotion you need to let yourself address a little more. Does that make sense? Let yourself feel the disillusionment you feel, the disillusionment about the search. Once you feel some of those emotions, you'll find a, a, lot, of our, a lot of our physical ailments in particular are created a, a bit from emotions we feel about ourselves but we're yet to release because we've been in our addiction. You see? A lot of times we can't discover truth until we let go of the emotion inside of us which is this panic to find the truth. Does that make sense? Like, because when we're panicked to find the truth, we're not actually in a state of longing for truth. We're in a state of fearing what the truth is. And we need to release that at some point to, to discover truth. So there's a lot of emotions that we are often in our addiction with. And disillusionment. Um, what's another type of emotion, Mary, that you had with that? It was like a, um, we called cynicism, cynicism. Cyn yeah, cynicism <coughs> and, uh, and those kind of emotions are, are all covers, if you like, over deep fears related to deep grief that we have about the world, the environment that we're living in and so forth. And even deep grief that we have about God, that we feel God doesn't exist, we feel God doesn't care. When's God ever wanted to have a relationship with me? Now, we're not realising in that place that God has always wanted a relationship with you, just not the addictive relationship you've had with your parents or some other person around you. Yeah. Yeah. So feel the disillusionment feeling. Let yourself feel it. Yeah, Raj? Um, Joshua, can you just talk about the... By the way, guys, if you're uncomfortable calling me Yeshua, don't do it. Can I just say that to you? If you're uncomfortable calling me Jesus, don't do that either. Don't, don't break your true self. If you're comfortable calling me AJ, call me AJ. Just don't call me late for dinner. That's it. <laughs> Go on. Yes, sure. Can you just um, uh, talk about the subtleties of addictions? Because I um, feel that there's a heap in there. I want to go into this in a lot of detail. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah. At this stage, I, what I want is for everyone to understand the overall picture of it all, if you like, and how it's interfering with your relationship with God. So as long as you all get that at this point, we can proceed on to the nitty-gritty of our presentation. Would you like that? What's the time? How long have I got? Another hour before a break, I think, close to. Is there any questions related to the overall picture... And then we can move on. Is there anyone that has a question about the picture itself? Not an individual question about the addictions, because we're going to move into that in a minute. 